You were going to tell us about that. You were going to tell us about that. Correct, correct. Right. Welcome back, everybody. We had a halachic question. I can't remember who asked it now, um, but the que- who can remember what the question was from last week? Okay, well, the question was this. Maybe when I tell you the question, the person who asked it might remember it because I can't remember who it was that asked it. But the question was this. We learned that a Kohen Gadol cannot marry a widow. But a regular Kohen can marry a widow, but cannot marry a divorcee. So what happens if you have a regular Kohen who marries a widow, which is permitted to him, and then he gets promoted to be the Kohen Gadol? What happens? What is the halakha? Does he uh, does he have to divorce this wife because he's no longer allowed to be married to a widow because he's now the Kohen Gadol? Or maybe, we didn't say this last week, but I maybe, thought about this. Maybe they don't appoint him. The first yeah, maybe, maybe he would not get appointed in the first place. Maybe that precludes him from being the Kohen Gadol because um, he is married to a widow. So that was the halachic question. Anybody remember who asked the question? Yeah, Michael Kraus. Was it you, Michael? Yes, it was. I was just concerned. I I actually was the one that you were thinking about is that can he be appointed if he's already married a widow? Right. And if he was appointed, would he have to get rid of the wife? One way or the other. I don't think think it would come to that. So what's what's your view, Michael? (laughs) <laughs> that's why I asked the question okay I, I, I'm putting you on the spot you have to give me a psak halacha what's your, <laughs> what's your feeling is he allowed to become the Kohen Gadol or is he not allowed to become the Kohen Gadol if he's married to a widow I'd go say, I'd say no he wouldn't be okay. allowed Michael says no anybody agree with Michael <laughs> sorry a quick question how was a Kohen Gadol chosen Ah, well, that's a good question. Um, the the cynical answer to that question is that in the majority of cases in the second temple, uh, it was chosen by bribery. Um, but it, how it should have been chosen is actually in this week's parsha, the beginning of this week's parsha, um, which we have already heard twice this week once on Shabbat afternoon and once on Monday morning. We'll hear it again tomorrow morning. And the verse says, David, what does the verse tell us? It's verse 10. I shall put it on the screen for you. There it is. Verse 10, Jeffrey. And the Kohen who is elevated above his brothers, upon whose head the anointment oil has been poured, who has been inaugurated to wear the garments, he shall not leave his hair unshorn or rend his garments. Okay, stop there. So the bit that I was referring to to answer Martin's questions, Martin's question is this here. Verse 10, Verha Kohen. Get rid of that. That's the next bit I was going to come to. Vehakohen hagadol meechav, the priest who is greater than his brothers. So it is meant to be appointed on a platform of meritocracy. Meritocracy. So the kohen who is greater than his brothers. Now, who decides that? Well, probably his brothers. I would have thought. Um, um, so it, it never happened like that very yeah, often. Sin of, sin of, we have. Yeah, I, yeah, Lahavdil, yeah. Lahavdil, yeah. yeah. There would have been some kind of synod, I guess, and the Kohen Gadol would have been appointed from amongst his his peers, the Kohen who is greater than all his other brothers. Um, so it was meant to be a meritocracy. As I said, sadly, during the Second Temple, at least, 
for the majority of the time um, it was corrupt. And if, in, in and some of the time, it was so corrupt that the coin Gadol wasn't even a coin. I know that sounds horrendous, doesn't it? But it was. There were some really rotten times during the, the, the Second Temple period. We have this, we do have this sort of um, fairy tale view of what was going on back in the day. Um, because that's part of our kindergarten Judaism, isn't it? That we were taught in kindergarten that everything was always wonderful. Um, uh, but it wasn't the truth, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, there was a many, many times in Jewish history where uh, things have not been as they should have been. And the high priesthood was one of the most uh, um, cogent examples of that because um, it was often very, very corrupt and violent as well. Uh, some of the Kohanim today aren't Kohanim. Well, that's an interesting question because um, they did some um, DNA research a few years ago and they found that the majority, the vast majority of people who claim to be Kohanim have a high percentage of Kohanic DNA. I'm not quite sure how they, I can't remember now. I did know at one point because I've, I've, I've forgotten how they established what the DNA of the coin was. They, they, they managed to do that. And it was very noticeable. It was significantly different. Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was significantly, uh, um, it was significant, what's this, in proportion, in, in, in uh, probability. Can't remember the exact expression now, but it was significant that the amount of Kohanic DNA in those people who claimed to be Kohanim on the whole was much higher, um, was statistically significant. That's the expression I was thinking of. Uh, statistically significantly higher than the non um, Kohanic population. So um, it's interesting actually that 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 it seems that. The Kohanim of today, generally speaking, do have uh, a, a a fair claim to be Kohanim, but uh, yeah, it was pretty it was pretty horrendous it, what went on there. So that answers Martin's question as to how the Kohen Gadol was chosen. So let's say, in our case, the Kohen who was Hagadol Meechav, who was greater than his brothers, um, happened to be already married to a widow the halacha according to michael kraus <laughs> is that he has to be passed over now i saw out the corner of my eye that leslie was shaking his head leslie come on tell us why you were shaking your head you don't agree with uh, with rabbi kraus why is that well he's made a decision this chief rabbi, he's obviously, um, this chief, sorry, Kohen Gadol, he's going to be hopefully Kohen Gadol. He's obviously got the attributes for it just because he did something which he could do prior to being appointed. I don't think it stops him from being appointed. Okay, all right. We'll just go along with that for a moment. Now, Can I say something. It yes, says, it doesn't it say he shall not marry, and he's already married, so he's not actually getting married if he's already married. Isn't it the act of marrying that's the problem? You see, you can tell a lawyer. You can always tell a lawyer, can't you? They, uh, <laughs> they, 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 they just hone in on the right on the, on the point. Okay, all right. Let's just put that to a side, Avril. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, Leslie, um, your point is that uh, it shouldn't preclude him because he married uh, the widow when he was allowed to. Indeed. That's okay, but now he's the Kohen Gadol and he's married to this widow. What's he going to do with her, according to you? Without a shadow of a doubt, stay married to her. Because? Because at the time he married her, he was able to be married. Okay, all right. Michael Kraus, have you anything to say in in uh, in rebuttal? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that tomorrow evening, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take that as a no. All right. So, anyway, I wasn't sure about this, so I um, asked my son, who knows about these things, because he is um, 
doing Dionysus and part of the Dionysus that he's already finished that section is on marriages and uh, Yevamot and Ketubot. And I'm trying to find the uh, the thing imaging now. There it is. Um, so here we go. This is, I don't know, can you see my screen with the WhatsApp chat on it? Yes. Yep. So, so, so this is how it goes. I asked him, if a Kohen marries a widow allowed and then gets promoted to Kohen Goddard, would he have to divorce the wife or would it preclude him from promotion in the first place? What do you think? He says, I don't think so. He married her beheter, meaning in a permitted way. So um, that was um, that was Leslie's point. And then I said, but would such a promotion even happen because it is promoting him to a position where he is and I've written here over a lav, which is Hebrew for he is transgressing a negative commandment, which is not to marry a widow. And Dan said he's not over anything. He's not transgressing anything. The uh, transgression is getting married. He's already married. Exactly Avril's uh, point. So I said, that's interesting. Getting married to a widow is osor. Being married to one is not. Yep. Uh, and he said, and I said, is that something that's brought down or is that your own logic? And he says, it's explicit in the Pasuk. And he quotes the Pasuk for us. Let's go back to the Pasuk. Um, here we go. Verse 14, Jeffrey, please. A widow, a divorcee, a woman who is desecrated or a prostitute, he shall not marry any of these. Only a virgin of his people may take as a wife. OK, let's stop there. The expression that Dan quoted there is this. Lo yikach. Yikach means to take, as you know. Lakachat is to take. In, in biblical Hebrew, in this, uh, in this context, it means to take as a wife. To take as a wife. We have that expression in English, don't we? Uh, somebody takes somebody as a wife. Um, uh, the, the, the feminists don't like it because it, it implies a, uh, a, um, a sort of that the, the man has uh, a, a, the permission to take, as it were, something. Uh, uh, do, you of, this, do you take this woman to be your, they say in the non-Jewish. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, correct. So it comes from here. So it's the taking, it's the marrying which is uh, not permitted, uh, not the um, actual state of being married. So let's go there. And I said there, uh, so he said, yeah, if he's already married, then there is no kitha, which is the verb, the, the noun for that. There is no taking while being a Kohen Gadol and is therefore not allowed and is not a uh, negative commandment. So, um, that was an interesting uh, little ex uh, uh, exchange I had this morning when doing my homework. Uh, I am consistent, if nothing else. When I was at school, I always did my homework at the very, very last minute, um, <laughs> and uh, if at all. Uh, and you can see from here, uh, this was at 9.54, uh, which was like um, 21 minutes before the shear was meant to begin. That's when I started to do my homework. But, but by, by 10 o'clock, I'd got the answer. So I left myself plenty time uh, to do my homework. What's okay. in Australia? Uh, no, that's our time, not Australian time. What time was it in Australia? Um, they're five hours ahead in Perth. So it's uh, three o'clock in the afternoon there. Right, so that was an interesting little exchange. It's very handy having your own diet uh, at the end of the WhatsApp. <laughs> So, um, uh, the, so there you are. That was the answer to uh, the, the uh, uh, conundrum that we had last uh, last time. Let's go back to the Gomorrah uh, and see what what we were talking about that brought all that up. up. And there it is. Um, and we were speaking, if you recall, <clears throat> about the Mishnah that said a high priest can perform chalitza with his brother's widow. Um, and he can have, or his wife can have chalitza, his widow can have chalitza done to her. Um, and we had a question. How is it possible 
that he should have to do chalitza. I think, I can't remember, this might have been David Marks asked this question. How would it be possible for them to have to do chalitza? Chalitza is for somebody who what refuses to do yibum, yibum being marrying the widow of the childless brother. Of course, the Kohen Gadol cannot do yibum because he's not allowed to marry this widow because we've just proved that from the Pasuk. Uh, and Avril has told us that that's not the case, not allowed to do that, not allowed to marry. So he can't do yibum at all. So if he can't do yibum, why should he have to do chalitza at all? Because chalitza is the get-out clause for not doing yibum, which you should be doing in the first place. Yibum is the, is the if you like, the gold standard of what you're meant to do. Chalitza is what you do if you're not prepared to do yibum. So he doesn't have to do yibum. He's not allowed to do yibum. So why should he have to do chalitza in the first place? So we had a question, and the answer to that was uh, in the next piece of Gomorrah. And it says, um, it, um, We've learned this um, in, a, uh, in a Mishnah. And it makes no difference. Lo shna. There is no difference. See that word shna? Difference? Where do you know that word from? Manishtana. Correct. Manishtana. What is different? Nishtana uh, literally means it's a passive form of the verb. It means what is being changed. Because it's a passive form. Nishtana. It's the same root. So Loshna makes no difference. With a shinui, with a shinui, you do, is that right? Correct. That's the same root. When you do something with a shinui, with a difference. Correct. If on Shabbat you have to do something that's not uh, correct, then if you, you should try and do it with a shinui, with a difference, that's right. So in other words, if you had to, for for um, uh, one reason or another, you had to switch on the air conditioning or the light or something, you would do it, what's called kilachar yad, with the back of your hand. Kilachar, the back of your hand. So you would put the switch on with the back of your hand. And that is called doing it with a shinui, with a difference, because you normally use the front of your hand, you use your finger. So if you do it like that, it's not doing it in the normal way. It's a difference, and that's called doing it with a shinui. Same word. Correct, Johnny. So it makes no difference whether uh, it's from the erusin, from the betrothal, or whether it's from the marriage. Remember, at the end of last week's or we went through the um, process of marriage, Jewish marriage, consists of two uh, sections. The first section is betrothal, when um, the commitment is made to marry. It's actually in Jewish law; it's part of the marriage, uh, part of the marriage process. In the old days, you would then go back. the 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 betrothed woman would go back to her father's house and prepare for marriage. It could take up to a year. And then a year later, uh, they would go to the chuppah, and that's called nisuin, marriage. And that is the end of the marriage process, followed by consummation of the marriage. So during, we don't do that today, as we explained last, uh, last time. We do it today all together. We do the erusin um, already under the chuppah. It's the first part of the marriage ceremony that you will all be familiar with, is Eirusin. We then read the Ketubah. And the reason we read the Ketubah is not because it's anybody's business to read that Ketubah. It just makes a separation between the two processes. You could read the yellow pages if you wanted. Uh, it doesn't have to be the Ketubah. It, you just have to have a separation between the two uh, processes. We read the Ketubah because it makes sense and it's something... Um, something uh, relevant and it also uh, uh, enables somebody clever to show how good their Aramaic is because it's jolly difficult. Uh, if anybody ever asks you uh, to, uh, they want to honour you with reading the Ketubah under the Kukupa, say no. 
because it's really, really difficult. Um, you can practice and practice and practice, and it's dead hard. So when you see they, these rabbis who are very used to doing these things and they just rattle it off, um, half the time they're getting it wrong, and the other half, they're very, very experienced because it's a difficult thing to do. But anyway, I digress for a change. Anyway, so we have this separation. And then the second part of the um, of the uh, ceremony is the Nisuin. Now, um, back in the day, there was this 12-month uh, period of Erusin, this 12-month period of, period of betrothal. And as we said last time, the uh, status of the woman during betrothal is almost that of a married woman. And they need a get if the marriage goes off, which is, of course, why we don't have that year's wait anymore. We, 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 do, it, we, we do it today for that uh, for, uh, together, as I've just described, for that exact reason, so that there isn't time for something to happen and there'll be a get in between the Arusin and the uh, Nisuin, it would be pretty difficult. You'd have to change your mind whilst the guy's reading the Kasuba uh, uh, for it to happen now. And that, and that was a very uh, clever institution of the rabbis so that you reduce the problems of having a get. Uh, now, so it's, it's a sort of a marriage. So let's say you had a scenario where a woman is betrothed to a man and then the betrothal goes off. It's Oith Shidduch, for whatever reason. It's usually financial, but whatever. Uh, there's a, there's a, it goes off and um, she gets her get. And she's now no longer a betrothed woman. But she's not a fully married woman either. And she remains a virgin because she's not consummated the marriage because the marriage never happened. Along comes a uh, along comes a coin gadol, and the question is, can he marry her? Can he marry this woman? Okay, Julia has put her head on the block by shaking it. Uh, I'm going to ask Julia why, Julia. You have to unmute. Why are you shaking your head and saying no? He can't marry her. Uh, well, to be quite honest, I think I think I, I read, just read ahead, <laughs> so I know that he can't. Okay, well, let's assume you hadn't read ahead. Why would you say he can't? Well, because she needed a get. Okay, so she needed a get, so that makes her a widow. Okay, all right. And does anybody disagree with uh, uh, Julia? Anybody dare to disagree with Julia? The, the, okay, so. This is an important concept we're going to learn now. We have said, let's go back to the, our Pasuk. Have you got anything on the screen? What have you got? The Gemara? Yes. Okay, let's go back to the Pasuk. Verse 14, um, Jeffrey, read it again for us, please. A widow, a divorcee, a woman who is desecrated or a prostitute, he shall not marry any of these. Stop okay. there, stop there, stop there. So that's pretty clear, isn't it? A divorcee. And we've already said that this woman who was betrothed is a divorcee to all intents and purposes. So he can't marry her because she's a divorcee. Now, the next part of the Pasuk, Jeffrey, please. Only a virgin of his people may he take as a wife. Okay, now... I'm going to tr translate that differently. I'd like you to, uh, whilst I'm doing this, Jeffrey, get out your art scroll, Chumish, and um, see what art scrolls say. It's uh, Vayikra chapter 21 is what you're looking for. The Hebrew <laughs> said... Almana ugrusha v'chalala zona et eile lo yikach. A widow, a divorcee, a prostitute, these lo yikach, he shall not take, okay? He shall not marry. And that's translated correctly. He shall not marry. It is a commandment. You shall not. Lo yikach. Now, the next bit of the Pasuk 
says ki im. What does ki im mean in Hebrew? So if. Because if. Or if. Yes, that's right. It, but what does that mean, uh, Leslie? When did you last use the expression for if in your All everyday right. conversation? Yeah. All right, absolutely. When Not mean anything for if. The word ki im in Hebrew means rather. So uh, it's ki im is it's it's the contrast to what we've just said. So he can't take a widow, a divorcee, and a uh, woman desecrated or a prostitute. Ki im rather betula a virgin meamav got to be a Jewish virgin, right? Yeah. Meamav from his people yikach. Now. He translates it here, and I don't like this translation. May he take as a wife, which gives him, uh, which sounds to me like he's got an option. He can either, if he if he wants to have a wife, then um, he's got to take a wife who is a virgin of his people. Okay, but that isn't what it says. It says yikach. What does how, how interested have you found it, Jeffrey? Yeah. Uh -huh. What does it say, please, in Art Scroll? Well, he should say. It's, there's a lot to be said here. Um, it, it, and I'm not sure which section you want me to read. But I I'm, want you to read verse 14 of chapter 21 of Vayikra in, he, right. in English. Okay. A widow, a divorcee, a desecrated woman, a harlot, he shall not marry these. Only a virgin of his people shall he take as a wife okay stop there now that's a better translation okay may is not a good translation is it because may means he may and he may not right shall you shall do something means exactly what it says you shall you must you have to and that is the halakha you cannot have an unmarried Kohen Gadol. Why can you not have an unmarried Kohen Gadol? We asked this question a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know if it was in the Gemara share or another share, I can't remember. Um, but I think it was in the Gemara share because I seem to recall uh, David Marks answering it for us. Why can you not have an unmarried Kohen Gadol? He's not... He's not committing a sin by marrying a widow, a divorcee, or a desecrated woman. He's not married anyone. Anyone? Okay, let's see if I was right and it was David that answered the question. David, why can you not have an unmarried Cohen Gadol? I don't, I don't remember. Uh, this oh, maybe question. it wasn't you that answered the question then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to I'm going to prize it out of you. What is the role of the Kohen Gadol in uh, in, in effect? What does the Kohen Gadol do? He does, does the, the avodah. He does the avodah. He does the service. When does he do the service? On Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur. And what is the purpose of that service on Yom Kippur? Presumably, so on his family and for Israel. So you need Thank to find you, Michael. Him. Say that again, Michael. Absolution for his family and Israel. So he needs a family. Correct. Correct. His job is lechaper to. I like that word to gain absolution. I like that, Michael. Although it sounds a bit Christian to me, <laughs> but um, uh, to uh, we'll go for atonement if you don't mind. Lechaper to atone to obtain atonement. Ba'ado, ba'ad, meaning for, ba'ado, for him, himself, ba'ad beto, for his household, u ba'ad adat kol Yisrael, and for the whole congregation of Israel. That is a halakha. The Kohen Gadol has to atone for himself, his beto, now, the rabbis tell us that Beto, his house, refers to children, his family. Specifically, his wife. His wife. wife. Beto means his wife. His house is his wife. So if you don't have a wife, 
he can't fulfill that mitzvah. Now, there is a very interesting thing that we learn in Masechet Yoma, which is the uh, um, the tractate which deals with the Avoda and Yom Kippur. And we've talked about this in the past in our uh, shiur. And that is that the Kohen Gadol has to have a wife. We've just shown you that. Because if he doesn't have a wife, he can't fulfill the correct role on Yom Kippur. What happens if his wife dies on Kol Nidre night? He's got to take another one straight away. Yeah, he's got to, he's got to straight away, he's got to be married. Um, and so what do they do, Michael? They've got a reserve set up ready for him. They do. They have a reserve Kohen Gadol set up in case he snuffs it. And they have a reserve Mrs. Kohen Gadol in case she passes away tragically prior to uh, Yom Kippur. Because the Kohen Gadol has to be married on Yom Kippur. Because if he doesn't, if he's not married, he can't do the service. And if he can't do the service, then the whole of Klal Yisrael will not get their kapara, their absolution. So um, a Kohen Gadol has to be married. So this, this translation, may he take, uh, we're going to reject that translation. And we are going to go instead in favour of the art scroll. Which says a virgin of his people, shall he take as a wife? So he has to have a wife. Now, why am John, I... Johnny? Yeah. Uh, am I correct in assuming that in times of the Tanakh, the, Co the Co Kohen Gadol was hereditary, and in the Second Temple period, uh, it was completely corrupt, uh, and, and anyone could assume the role. Uh, think, even non Kohen. Well, um, we, if, if that's the case, uh, this explains one of the reasons that's given for the death of Nadav and Avihu. Because Nad, I think Nadav was, was the the older, and uh, one one of the uh, Midrashim said that the reason that they died was that they refused to get married. That makes very good sense. Now, let's just, you, you, there was a lot in there. Let's un unpack what you just said. Um, you, you said, is it correct that during the time of Tanakh it was hereditary? Well, we know that, don't we, uh, to a degree, from the Shmuel Aleph Shia. Yeah. Because who was seen as unfitting he to take done. over? Well, yeah, a... Ailey's sons, can anybody remember what their names were? Jeffrey oh. read them out last week, actually, in the Shia, even though we talked about it some time uh, uh, ago. They were read out yet last week in the Shia. Who can remember their names? The names of Ailey's sons. Well, one of them's a good Kohanic name, give you a clue. David, can you remember? Yeah, Chofni and Pinchas. Chofni, which is not a particularly common name, and Pinchas, which is a very Kohanic name. Chofni and Pinchas, yes. And what happened to them? They were considered unfit to take over from Ailey. So the fact that they were considered unfit means that Lechat Chila, in the first instance, they ought to, by rights, have taken over. But the people said, they're no good. They're wrong uns, these two. And we, you can't, we can't have them as the Kohen Gadol. So therefore, um, uh, we need to have... And what was the whole, what was the whole purpose of the, all this going on here? Um, this, the whole purpose of this whole thing was, was to show, as David has said, the um, hereditary nature of this. So... You've got this hereditary nature uh, of of the coin, uh, the kahuna, um, and uh, that's correct. And then in the second temple, uh, uh, as David said, and as we said earlier on, it was completely corrupt, um, and um, it was uh, open to bribery. So that way, it makes very good sense. Now, what then David went on to say was that Nadav and Avihu had to be uh, got rid of 
out of the line, if you like, because they refused to get married. That's part. That was part of what one of the uh, opinions of their sin was that they refused to get married. Why did they get refused? Why did they refuse to get married, David? Do, do you know what the midrash says about that? Yeah, that they thought it was beneath them to uh, be married to have a wife. They thought it was beneath them to indulge in pleasures of the flesh. Mm. Most specifically, um, they were, I suppose, Lahavdil. Uh, taking on the view of what, you know, Trappist monk type of thing where, you know, celibacy, where you go off and, uh, uh, and, and dedicate your life to uh, holiness and remove yourself from uh, everyday life. In, in, in particular, the mitzvah of pru uruvu, of, of procreation. No, and, and, and this is the shot that's given by Rashi, on Kadoshim to you, Prishut. Yeah, correct. But Kadoshim to you, Prishut means separation in a holy way and not separation in a way that you think it should be. Uh, and and as you all know, one of my pet hates is Khumra. Um, and in effect, that, that Midrash is saying that Nadav and Aviyu were punished for taking on Khumras. Nobody told them that you are so holy as the as the as the sons of Aaron and the Cohen Gadol elect, as it were, that you have to say take upon yourself to be so holy that you think that getting married is beneath you. That's Khumra. Uh, uh, and that's what happens to people who uh, take on Khumras. Uh, uh, that may be a bit harsh, but it fits my my narrative very nicely. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's interesting, isn't it? So why am I, why am I flogging this to death here? Uh, why have I said I don't like the word may and I prefer the word shall? And you will see very shortly why. What do we have here with this coming at all? We have a negative commandment that he is not allowed to marry a widow, divorcee or prostitute. <laughs> He also has a positive commandment that he must, he shall, not he may, he shall marry a virgin. Okay? Jewish so got, virgin. Say, Jeffrey? A Jewish virgin. A Jewish virgin, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's got a negative commandment, you can't, and a positive commandment, you must. Okay, bear that in mind. That's what we have with the Kohen Gadol. Let's go back to the Gomorrah now. Now, um, we have just said, he's not, he, he can do Chalitza, um, and it makes no difference whether it is an Eresin, a betrothed woman, or a uh, married woman. And so he goes on and he says, why does he have to do um, Chalitza? Why can't he do Yibum? And he said, and, and the Gemara says, Bish Loma Min Hanisuin. I understand. I understand why um, why he cannot do Yibum, marry uh, uh, this woman after the full marriage process. In other words, after the chuppah. Why? Have ase velotase. Because he will be, by, by doing the yibum, he will be transgressing a negative commandment because he's marrying a widow. And he will also be transgressing or not doing a positive commandment because he has a positive commandment to marry a virgin and she's not a virgin. So he's doing two naughty things, right? If he does yibum. But yibum is what? It's a mitzvah to do yibum. Yibum is a positive commandment. Now, what we're going to learn now is a really interesting and important halachic principle. It often is the case that you have 
a positive commandment which seems to contradict a negative commandment. Right? Who can think of one? A positive commandment that that contradicts a negative commandment. Okay, that's why you might override a yeah. negative commandment. But actually, uh, uh, the Torah tells you to do something. And at the same time, by doing that, you could be breaking a negative commandment. I'll give you a clue. I did this quite a lot of times. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a dozen. Maybe more. Not much of a clue, was it? Okay. No. All right. Save a life. I'll give you a bigger clue. Then. I, I did this quite a few times as a moil. You broke your butt by a knife. Correct. A Brit Mila on Shabbat. The Brit Mila, the positive commandment is you shall do a Brit Mila when? Eighth day. On the eighth day. On Shabbat, there is a negative commandment that says you're not allowed to shecht. You're not allowed to cut. You're not allowed to draw blood. So how can you have a situation where one Torah mitzvah contradicts another? That makes sense. Now, you all know what the answer is, that we do do a Brit Mila on Shabbat, don't we? So yeah. there is a halachic concept. What halachic concept can you uh, derive from that? There are exceptions. Okay, so there's a pecking order. Yeah. What takes precedent? A positive commandment or a negative commandment? Positive. A positive commandment because you do the Brit on Shabbat. Another example. Sit, sit. Sit, sit. What does the Torah tell you about sit, sit? You all, say, you all say it twice a day at least. Or a eat them out and you should see them. Okay, before that. You should put them on the four corners of the Correct, board. correct. Hakanaf Patil Techelet. You should put this blue thread and the tzitzit -tzit on the corners of your garment. Al Kamfei Big Dehem. What are they made of? These uh, tit sit. Shatness. They are, well, they're not made of shatness necessarily. Um, they're made of wool. The tit sit are made of wool. What well, David is, of course, ahead of the game. What happens if you have a four cornered garment made out of linen? You can't. And then you put your sit sit on them. What have you done wrong? Shatness. shatness. Okay, so you've got shatness. Sh what is shatness, Jeffrey? It's a mixture of wool and linen, and you can't mixture do that. Of wool and linen in the same garment. So you have a positive commandment to put sit sit on your four cornered garment. You have a negative commandment not to wear shatness. You have a linen garment. What are you going to do? Okay. Diane, who should we appoint as a Diane now? Uh, um, and we will appoint Johnny Halpern the Diane. Diane Halpern, yes. how are you going to Paskin? I've come to you with my Shiloh. I've got a linen garment and I, I want to put my woolen sits on. To fulfill the mitzvah of Al Kamfei Big Day, and what, what are you going to advise me to do? Uh, well, it's saying a positive uh, commandment overrides a negative one that put the sitzes on. 
Very good. Well done. That's exactly what the halacha is. Let me show you. Let me show you a Gemara. Let me show you a Gemara. Actually, it might even be a Mishnah. I think it's the Gemara. Okay. Now then, look at this. Uh, we are in Yevamot. Can you see the screen, by the way? Yes. We are in Yevamot. Daf Dalad Ahmed Allah, 4A in Yevamot. And it says, Dictive, it is written, Lo Tilbash Shatnez. You shall not wear Shatnez, mixture of wool and linen. There is another pasuk that says, Gidilim Ta'aseh Lach. You shall make Gidilim Tzitzit for yourself. Okay? Says the Gemara, um, this teaches us that the prohibition against wearing divide, diverse kinds of woolen linen, shatness, it is permitted. Despite that, it is permitted to prepare ritual fring, fringes of diverse kinds, e.g. sky blue dyed threads of wool on linen garments. This shows that the positive mitzvah of ritual fringes overrides the prohibition of diverse kinds. Exactly as Rabbi Halpern has said, uh, the uh, uh, positive... Please, don't know. Don't help him, I beg your pardon. Yeah, beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, the, the positive commandment of tzitzit overrides the negative commandment of, um, of shatness. Okay, that's straightforward, right? Why couldn't you ban linen altogether from tzitzit? What'd you say, Michael? Why couldn't you ban linen altogether from tzitzit, from the garments? Say, well, you're not allowed, since we've got to have the fringes out of wool or whatever else. You're never uh, allowed but... to wear a linen garment? Yes. Well, that would still be a negative commandment. And we have a principle that a positive commandment overrides a negative commandment. If you had a... Okay, let me come back to it in a minute, because I nearly spoiled the fun then for a minute. Um, uh, so let's go, um, let's go and think about this now. We've got two things. Tzitzit, which is a positive commandment. Shatnes, which is a negative commandment. Tzitzit overrides Shatnes. Positive overrides a negative. Now, what happens if you have a positive commandment which contradicts a negative commandment and a positive commandment. In other words, you've got one on one side of the equation and two on the other side of the equation. What happens then? It's not one against one, one against two. Do we then say that the double whammy of the positive commandment and the negative commandment overrides the positive commandment? Or does the first positive commandment override both of them? What do you say, Sanhedrin? I've got an example of that. I will give you an example right now. Easier to. I'll give you an example. Uh, Jeffrey, read our Passover again for us, please. 14 on the screen or in your book, if you prefer. <clears throat> a widow, a divorcee, a woman who is desecrated or a prostitute, he shall not marry any of these. Only a virgin of his people may he take as a wife. Or shall he take as a wife, we all say. Yeah. Okay. That is a positive and a negative, right? We've already said that. <laughs> so we've got this Kohen Gadol, when he marries a virgin, he does two things. He fulfills a positive mitzvah and he avoids a negative transgression. When he has a brother who dies childless and he's going to do yibum, that is what? He's going to marry this woman, yibum. Yibum is what? A positive commandment, right? It's a positive commandment. So the example, Johnny, is this. The Kohen Gadol has a positive commandment to do yibum, right? If he does yibum, with the widow of his brother, he transgresses the negative commandment of not marrying a widow, 
and also the positive commandment of marrying a virgin. One against two. Got it? Yep. So what, what's the halacha? Can he do the yibum? If it was just, and this is what the Gemara says, let's go back to the Gemara. I understand why he can't do yibum after the marriage has been consummated because he's transgressing two against one. The yibum is only one mitzvah, whereas marrying the widow, he's doing two bad things, one against two. OK, I understand that. But then the Gemara says, and we're over the page now, we should make a seal. We've turned over the page. <laughs> One positive commandment does not override a negative and a positive. Ella, but minha eru sin. What about from the betrothal? The woman's still a virgin. So he's not transgressing. Um, marrying a virgin. He might be transgressing marrying a widow if she's considered a widow from the betrothal. But in that situation, look what the Gemara says, Yavo, he should come, this assay, this positive commandment of Yibum should come along, the Yidche, and should push aside the Lotase of not marrying a widow. We've already said a positive commandment overrides a negative commandment. After the betrothal, after the betrothal, you would think that that would apply. He's only, it's one against one. It's not one against two because he has not transgressed the uh, Avera of, uh, of not marrying a virgin because she is a virgin at that point. Does everybody understand where we're at at this point? What the Gemara is asking. The Gemara is asking, I don't understand why he can't do Yibum with a woman who is betrothed to his brother and then his brother dies before the wedding. I don't understand why he can't do Yibum, says the Gemara. He should be able to do Yibum because it's a positive commandment of Yibum against a single negative, don't marry a widow. And if you want to add a bit more sauce to it, you can say she's not even a real widow because she's only like Hetzi widow kind of thing. So that's where the Gemara is at at the moment. It's a question. Why can he not do Yibum? With, I understand why he can't do Yibum with, with somebody who's already fully married to his brother because it's one against two with the commandments. Yeah, like we've just learned. But one against one. You've all told me you can put your tzitzit on a linen garment. You can do a bris on Shabbos. Why can't he do yibum with a betrothed woman? And that, so you can't look on, is where we will stop. Uh, and uh, don't look on. Uh, and uh, what I want you to do for homework is I want you to work it out for yourself. Why the Gemara... Uh, why Why the halacha is what it is, which is that he cannot do yibum with a betrothed woman. Um, the Gemara has asked a very good question, and I want my Sanhedrin to come up with a very good answer. OK, but no cheating, no looking on. OK. Any questions so far today? Yes, David. Lots, but uh, I'll just give you one for a moment. So just looking briefly at, at the, the source that you provided in your Vamo, the reason why um, it sit with linen garments and uh, Yibum um, and Chalitza together uh, are, are, are chosen is because they're juxtaposed in the same Pasuk. There's no juxtaposition between uh, Miller on Shabbos. Correct. And so how can, we, how can we put them in the same category? I'm just looking. And in... are, are, are there any other examples you can think of? Okay, so I'm looking in um, 
I'm looking in this Gemara because actually in this Gemara they talk about that juxtaposition, of course. Yeah, yeah, and, and it goes on. It's a, it's a very long sukkia there. Yeah, there so we go. Look. There we go. It's a juxtaposition here. Smuchim, uh, uh, smuchim. They are they are juxtaposed. That's right. So you can learn from the juxtaposition, uh, but just because they're juxtaposed, it doesn't mean that the principle of Ase doche lotase doesn't apply when they're not juxtaposed. Because that is a halachic principle, isn't it? Yeah. Ase doche lotase is a halachic principle. Uh, and so you could argue that this um, sitzit one is not a good one to do because of the juxtaposition, because you could argue that it's only because they're juxtaposed. But we know that it's not the case. So that's why but I brought so, the meal so let, let, let me Let me give you another example then. Batav Chalav, written three times in the Torah, but it's not juxtaposed, juxtaposed to eating on Erev Yom Kippur. So we could say there's a love of not eating milk and meat or, or any of the three combinations of milk and meat, and there's a mitzvah of eating on Erev Yom Kippur. Therefore, can you eat a kosher... Uh, cheeseburger on Erev Yom Kippur? No. And the obvious answer to that is because you can fulfil the mitzvah of uh, of Yom Kippur, of Erev Yom Kippur, without eating meat and milk. It's not a one or the other. Uh, and you could fulfil the mitzvah of Sitzit without wool and linen. Not, without, not on that garment you can't. That would be like saying you could fulfill the mitzvah of eating on another day. You have that garment. You own a four-cornered garment. Okay. You've only got two choices. Either you yeah. dispose of the garment or you put on tzitzit. Whereas on and your kippah, you, you have a choice. You the, can either eat boss of a cholov or you can eat something that isn't boss of a cholov. And, and if the only thing that you have to eat I the same as the only garment that you have to put on in the morning is wool and linen. Um, are you telling me it's a mitzvah to wear clothes? It's a positive mitzvah to wear clothes? No, it's a, it's a positive. It's a positive mitzvah to wear sitzit. Correct, and I'm saying. I'm saying that it's, that it's from there that you learn ase do chelotase. Okay, so if you have no four cold, four cornered garments, um, is there still uh, a positive uh, mitzvah to, to put on sit sit? No. I mean, to, exactly. No. To, to, and today we don't really have any four cornered garments. So therefore, we have to make them. Uh, uh, yes, you can't. You can't say, "Well, you're exempt from sit sit because you no longer are wearing any garment that qualifies that, that requires sit sit." Yes, you can. That's yes, you can. Absolutely, you can. If you do not own a four corner garment, or you don't even want to wear a four corner garment, if you don't want to wear a four cornered garment, you have not done any avera by walking out. I remember being told as a kid, and I'm sure the boys here here were all told the same things in Feder. You weren't allowed to walk four amas, which is six feet. You weren't allowed to work four amas without a capel on and without sitzes on. Hands up if you were told that as a kid. Yeah. Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> Only Michael wasn't told that. That you Manchester. know. Yeah. Well, um, so, uh, it, sorry, I remember being told. You don't, not that you have to wear a four corner garment, you may wear a four corner garment. Correct. So it wasn't a commandment to wear a four corner garment, but if you did, then you must have tits it. Correct, correct, correct. And obviously, you didn't come from Manchester because we were told we had to wear them. Uh, uh, and it's wrong. You are correct. Uh, you well, did not it, have to in, wear a four In London, garment. it was part of the school uniform. Right, that, but that may well be. But it doesn't mean that halachically it, you are obliged. For example, I'll give you an example. I am going to go out for a run shortly. I am not going to wear my tzitzit when I go out for a run. Why? Because they're going to get all sweaty and horrible, right? 
It's not, I'm not doing anything wrong. You are doing something wrong, as Martin has said. If you have a four-cornered garment and you walk out with a four-cornered garment without tzitzit, that's, uh, you have transgressed. If you okay, don't have okay, a four-cornered garment... So if you, if, uh, assuming that you're in the gym all day, are you saying that you're also exempt from putting on a talit gadol in the morning and making a bracha on it? Okay, what, so, what's the purpose of uh, making a bracha on talit gadol? Uh, again, it, it, it's a mitzvah reshut. It's become a chiyuv. It's become an obligation because we've made it into an obligation. But let's say you don't have a talit, okay? It's happened to me once before. I went on holiday, took my tefillin, and idiot I am, forgot to take my talis. And I'm in the middle of nowhere, right? There isn't even a Chabad nearby, right? What am I meant to do? Nothing you I can got do. Your tal- you still make a bracha on your talit katan. Okay, okay. I mean, you're right. But let's say I've forgotten them as well. I'm a real okay. idiot, okay? Yeah. Um, now... I, uh, I'm not over anything. I just have, I missed an opportunity to do a mitzvah. But so I'm not over. Say, so you could say the same thing about tefillin then? No, you can't. On tefillin it says, You have to do it. It's a positive commandment. Okay? And the halacha is, you, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what it's like, uh, David. By the way, those of you that would wish to leave, just leave, because we're just getting off in, you know, in a tangent. If you're interested, stay, but if you don't feel obliged. David, it's like this. Um, if you have a four-cornered garment, then you have to put your tzitzit on, because it says you shall put them on the corners of your garment. What does it say about tefillin? Okesharatum laot al yadecha. You shall tie them on your, uh, as a sign on your hand, on your arm. What if you don't have an arm? You can put it on your head. All right. But are you, have you done an Avera? No, because you haven't got an arm to do it on. Right? So it's not the same because I do have an arm and I'm always going to have an arm, hopefully. So I've always got an obligation to put on to fill in. It's not an obligation to have a four-cornered garment. If I don't want to have a four-cornered garment, I don't have to have one. I can't not have an arm. And if I do have not have an arm, chas v'chalila, I don't have that. Uh, that. So it is, it's analogous. There's a difference between to fill in, which is an obligation because you've always got an arm to put it on. With tzitzit, you don't have to wear tzitzit. I remember as a kid thinking... The, the boys who did not wear tzitzit, they were such shkutsim. How could you do such a thing? How could you go, you know, uh, they're doing such a terrible Avera. One thing sticks in my mind. The last day of Jewish day school, um, there used to be, where I went to school, there used to be, it used to be an old house. It's not knocked down now, but it used to be a big old house which was converted into a school. I uh, went there before, I went there before you. And it's old house. Yes. Uh, and it, you, do you remember the, the, the long grassy slope in front of it yeah well, on, the, on the last day of school you were allowed only the last year that were leaving school that day were allowed to do roly polies all the way down that hill right i remember that yeah and i remember there was one kid who was a, he ended up in prison this kid actually but anyway he he, he took off his sitsis and he put them on the ground stamped on them right this is a kid of 11 years old Stamped on these sitzes, tore them up, and then did his roly polies down the, the, the hill. And it stuck in my mind. And I, what a terrible thing to do, which is a terrible thing to do. And I used to think that people didn't wear sitzes. If you saw somebody without sitzes, that was a terrible thing. You'd just chosen not to wear a four corner gum. You missed an opportunity to do a mitzvah. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but it's not an Avera. It's a very different thing. You don't have to wear sitzes. Okay. But if you're going to wear a four-cornered garment, like Martin said, then you have to put sitzes on. Okay, enough of all Sorry, this. Sorry, one last quick comment. We were talking yes. earlier about corrupt uh, Kohanim, Gador. Yeah. Surely on Yom Kippur, there's a good chance they would have been killed yeah. during yeah. the service. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, you're right. And then, uh, you, then you get the next one in. <laughs> I, don't know why, I don't know why you'd want the job, to be honest. 
most of them were killed, weren't they, on the day? Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of them, yeah, yeah, because they were corrupt. Uh, but you know, why this, would anybody? This want is why them? they had a rope. This is why they had a rope tied round them when they went into the uh, goddess club. I think that's right. That's right. Because if they weren't up to the job, they would die. Now, who's going to get them out? You're not allowed to go in. So they had a rope tied to them, and then you would slap them out if they were, if they didn't, if they didn't survive. And I don't know why anybody would want the job really, but I don't know why anybody would want to be a prime minister or a president either. Uh, it's a bit the same. You know, it's also corrupt and it's also, you know, you're likely to get killed. Anyway, well, just ask you, Johnny, you said before it was a clever thing the rabbi did about this gap business. I can't remember. Yeah, be because, because by making, because making the Eriton... A Guna business out of it. Uh, well, they could do if they were, if they had the... If they had asking, the when, how long ago was it when they did this that you're talking about? Well, some people still do still do an Eriton for a year. There's, there are certain Hasidim um, who still do it. Uh, the vast majority of Klal Yisrael don't. I don't know when it first came in, actually. Don't know. Okay. I'll try and find out. But, um, but yeah, the, to, to answer your question about the Aguna, they could solve that really without too much difficulty if, they, if there was a will to do so. The problem is there isn't a will to do so. Uh, OK, let's uh, call it a day. To that. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Next week you're in London, aren't you? Yes, I'll, no, right. I'll be in Manchester. But yes, no shield next week I'll be in Manchester. Okay, yeah. thank you.